Today we'll be covering Chapter 32, Spinal Injury and Spine Motion Restriction. This is brought to you by Southern Star Health Education, and we're going to be using the 11th edition of the Pre-Hospital Emergency Care Book. We're going to be going over anatomy and physiology of spinal injury, emergency care for suspected spinal injury, guidelines for spine motion restriction, spine motion restriction techniques, and special considerations. Vehicle collisions, falls, and recreational activities pose the risk of spinal injury. Spine includes injuries to the spinal column and to the nervous system. Patients with spinal injury must be handled in such a way as to avoid movement to the spine. The nervous system has two major functions, communication and control. It enables awareness of and reaction to the environment and coordinates body response to changes in the environment. The nervous system is broken down into central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And the central nervous system is basically, consi it basically consists of the brain and the spinal column. Everything else that leads away from the spinal column and the brain is considered your peripheral nervous system. The functional divisions of the nervous system. This consists of the voluntary and autonomic systems. The voluntary system influences the activity of skeletal muscles. The autonomic influences the activity of voluntary muscles and glands, which consist of your sympathetic and your parasympathetic systems. The skeletal system consists of your skull and spinal columns. The skull itself is broken down in your posterior portion, which is your cranium, and your anterior portion, which is your face. Spinal column consists of 33 vertebrae, in five divisions. The vertebrae bound together by ligaments and the vertebrae is also separated by discs. Spinal column consists of your cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. Within these you have seven cervical vertebrae, you have 12 thoracic vertebrae, we have five lumbar vertebrae, and normally we have four few sacral, and then the coccyxia, which is the tail end of the spinal column. If you notice on this picture, where your cervical and lumbar, you have inward curvatures as opposed to the thoracic and sacral, which is outward curvatures. The spinal column. The spinal cord consists of nerve tissues. Spinal cord tracts consist of motor tracts that carry impulses to the same side of the body pain tracks that carry impulses from the opposite side of the body, and light touch tracks that carry impulses from the same side of the body. Now, there's other terms that we use. We use efferent nerves and afferent nerves, and we'll go over those as we go along. Common mechanisms of spinal injury. Vehicle collisions, most common cause. 85% of patients with a spinal fracture or dislocation do not present a neurological deficit. Improper handling of the spinal column injury may actually result in neurological injury. The spine is susceptible to injury from several mechanisms, which we'll be going over in a few minutes. This slide shows the mechanisms of spinal injury. It is very important for us to look at the mechanism of injury so we can determine what type of spinal injury the patient actually succumbed to. Spinal column injuries versus spinal cord injuries. In spinal column injury, we're talking about damage to the protective casing that we have uh, around the spinal cord. So in spinal column injury, we have fractures and dislocations, which usually result in pain and tenderness. In the spinal cord injury, we have damage to the nervous tissue, which basically disrupts in movement and sensation. Complete spinal cord injury, you have a transection of the cord, loss of motor, sensory, and autonomic functions below the injury site. In spinal shock, 
can also result in initial presentation with complete loss of function. Now patients in spinal shock can present with complete paralysis that might resolve within 24 hours to several days of the injury itself, as opposed to complete spinal cord injury. In spinal shock, you have loss of sympathetic control. You have neurogenic hypotension, which is caused by vasodilation of arterioles. You also have diminished release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, and the skin is warm and dry, and the pulse rate is normal. In males, you might actually develop an involuntary erection, also known as priapism. Incomplete spinal cord injury. Injury does not involve all three tracks. Some, but not all, signs of spinal injury are present, and the pattern of loss of function is reflected on different syndromes. This slide consists of a cross-section of the spinal cord showing the H-shaped gray matter surrounded by white matter. Now you have to imagine of you standing on top on the top of a patient and basically the spinal cord is severed and that's what you're looking at straight from the top to the bottom. Now uh, each results in distinctive syndrome or pattern of sensory and motor deficits. You have a central cord syndrome results from injury to the central cord. The anterior cord syndrome results from injury to the anterior cord and brown sequoia syndrome results from the injury to the right or left half of the cord itself. The cord syndrome, the medial portion of the motor and pain tracks control the upper extremities. The lower portion of the tracks control the lower extremities. In central cord syndrome, the medial portion of the spinal cord is injured. The patient presents with loss of motor function or weakness and loss of pain sensation to the upper extremities, while the motor and sensory functions remain normal in the lower extremities. In the anterior cord syndrome, you have loss of function in motor and pain tracks, but not in light touch tracks. The patient experiences paralysis and inability to feel pain below the level of the injury, but can actually detect light touch. In the cord syndrome, the injury affects only one side of the cord. You have loss of motor and light touch sensations on the affected side. You also have loss of pain sensation on the side opposite of the injury. Assessment-based approach, spinal cord injury. Remember you have to do a scene size up and look for mechanisms of injury. Look for crash, falls, blunt penetration trauma, sporting or recreational injuries, or gunshot injuries, or electrical. Remember to look for the mechanism of injury. Based approach. Do a scene size up. This leads you to look to find the mechanism of injury. The mechanism of injury usually heightens your suspicion that a potential injury might actually have occurred. It does not provide any evidence that an injury did occur. Deduce the mechanism of injury from evidence at the scene. Determine if such a mechanism could have injured the spine. In this slide, we show front-end damage of a motor vehicle collision. We do notice that there's more than a 12 inches of indentation at the crash site itself. You also have what looks like a cracked windshield. Now, the evidence should create a high index of suspicion that the patient was actually propelled forward in the crash and struck head first. So look for all these signs that tell you that you have a high index of suspicion for spinal injury. In the primary assessment, with mechanisms of injury consistent of potentials for spine injury, immediately provide inline manual stabilization of the spine. Use jaw thrust maneuver to open the airway and follow local protocols for spine motion restriction.
manual stabilization of the spine based on mechanism of injury. Maintain manual stabilization until a thorough assessment does not reveal indications for motion restriction or spine motion restriction has been accomplished. Provide spine motion restriction on patients with positive mechanism of injuries who have altered mental status, have pain distracting injuries, and cannot effectively communicate with you. High priority patients are usually the unresponsive, responsive but unable to obey commands, abnormal respiratory, respiratory uh, patterns, and obvious signs of spine injury. Secondary assessment, maintain an inline spinal immobilization, conduct a physical exam. After assessing the neck, apply cervical collar, assess pulse and motor and sensory functions. Assess flexion, and when you do this, you try to bring the body portion towards the, the core of the body. You assess extension also by bringing the body part away from the core of the body. Assess finger abduction and adduction. You assess the wrist and hand and plantar flexion also. Assess dorsiflexion and assess pain response in the hand. Also assess pain response in the foot. Assess light touch response in the hand touch response in the foot. Assessment-based approach, injury secondary assessment, uh, posterior exam, log rule the patient with a spine motion restriction maintained to assess the posterior body. Palpate the area of the spine gently and look for evidence of deformity, tenderness, contusions, lacerations, punctures, swelling, uh, to any part of the spinal area and if you find anything like this it should heighten your suspicion of spinal cord injury. Take a set of vital signs. If the brain or spinal cord is damaged vital signs might reflect neurological hypotension. If the hypotension is severe and the patient has tachycardia suspect bleeding as the cause of shock. history from the responsive patient. Assess for allergies, medications, past medical history, and last food or drink taken. And look for events prior to the onset of the signs and symptoms. Signs and symptoms, tenderness along the spine, pain associated with movement, pain independent of palpation or movement, deformity of the spine on palpation, and soft tissue injuries. Spinal motion restriction should be based on physical assessment findings and not solely on the mechanism of injury. Other signs and symptoms include numbness, tingling, weakness, loss of sensation and motor function, loss of bladder or bowel control, priapism, impaired breathing. It is imperative to recognize that a patient's lack of pain in the spinal column or his ability to walk, move his extremities and sensation does not rule out the possibility of spinal column injury. Assessment findings that are indications for spine motion restriction. Glasgow comma scale of less than 15, suspected traumatic brain injury, altered mental status, pain or tenderness of spinal column, paralysis, weakness, and numbness and tingling. Deformity of vertebral column under the influence of drugs or alcohol cannot communicate effectively and has a painful distract and injury are indications of spine motion restriction also.
Complications of spine injury, inadequate breathing effort, paralysis to the respiratory muscles that can lead to respiratory failure. Respirations may be shallow with little movement or chest or abdomen and provide positive pressure ventilation. Complications of spine injury, paralysis, paraplegia, quadriplegia, hemiplegia, which is the most common in head injuries and stroke. Complications of spine injury include, uh, include inadequate circulation, vasodilation leads to hypotension and poor tissue perfusion, and the skin may actually be warm and dry, and the heart rate is normal to slightly decreased. Emergency medical care. Use standard precautions. Establish inline spinal stabilization. If the patient complains of severe pain to the neck or cervical spine, or the head does not easily move, maintain the head in the position found. This slide shows you how to keep an inline spinal stabilization. Keep the head in neutral position and the nose in line with patient's navel. Ensure that the head is in neutral inline position. In airway and breathing, Use a jaw thrust maneuver if necessary. Provide positive pressure ventilation for inadequate breathing. Maintain an SpO2 greater than 94%. Suction secretions without turning the patient's head to the side. Assess the pulse motor function and sensation in all extremities. Assess the neck before applying a cervical collar and then apply the cervical collar. Provide spine motion restriction to the patient on the longboard. After placement of the backboard, reassess postmotor and sensory functions, and then transport. It's usually safer to err on the side of caution and provide spinal motion restriction if spinal injury is suspected. Reassessment, airway and breathing, vital signs, complaints, and interventions. Make sure that the interventions that you've actually done uh, are working and then they're not be more aggressive on the type of treatment that you're going to give the patient. Historical perspective. Spinal immobilization until 2013, immobilization was a standard of care for any patient found to have mechanism of injury which may result in spinal injury. When it comes to spinal motion restrictions, the American College of Emergency Physicians recommends spine motion restriction over immobilization attempts. Indications for spine motion restriction, fo follow your local protocols, use criteria to clear the spine, must be reliable patient, unreliable patients with qualifying mechanism of injury must be provided with spinal motion restrictions. Spinal motion restrictions is necessary for an unreliable patient, patients with a neurological deficit, pain and tenderness near the vertebral column, and distracting injuries. Indications for spinal motion restriction. Spinal motion restriction is not necessarily for reliable patients who communicate, no spinal pain or tenderness, no abnormal neurological findings, and no distracting injuries or indications. Protocols vary widely. All spinal motion restriction protocols have fallen out of favor due to the poor outcomes of these patients. Tools for spinal motion restriction. Cervical collars. Cervical collars can increase intracranial pressure. Cervical collars can cause pressure sores and increase in difficulty in managing the airway with a cervical collar. This is using the technique to actually measure uh, the size of the neck as opposed to the size you're gonna be using for a cervical collar. Use your fingers to measure the distance from the shoulder to the chin and adjust your cervical collar 
the collar. How to apply a servo collar to a seated After selecting the proper size, slide the cervical collar up the chest wall. The chin must cover the central fastener in the chin piece. Recheck the position of the head and collar for proper alignment. Make sure that the patient's chin covers the central fastener of the chin piece. If further tightening is, will cause hyperflexion of the patient's head, select the next smaller size. How to apply a cervical collar to a supine patient. Slide the back portion of the cervical collar behind the patient's neck, fold the loop Velcro inward and foam padding. Position the collar so that the chin fits properly. Secure the collar by attaching the Velcro itself. Hold the collar in place by grasping the trachea hole. Attach the loop Velcro so it mates with the hook Velcro itself. Placing the supine patient on longboard. Full body spinal restriction devices. You have longboards and alternative long devices for spine motion restriction, as in the vacuum mattress or scoop stretchers. Spine motion restriction devices. You have the KED, also known as a Kendrick extrication device, is the most, uh, the most common one. These devices are rarely used. Some EMS systems might make it part of their spinal motion restriction protocol, so you need to be familiar with the proper use of this device. Other Spinal motion restriction equipment is you have your head stabilization devices and straps. Ambulatory patient. Self-restriction and assessing the ambulatory patient. A reliable patient with no indications of spinal injury or reason for spinal motion restriction does not require it. Extract the patient to hold his head and neck in the neutral inline position during your evaluation. The ambulatory patient, performing a spinal motion restriction to an ambulatory patient, apply cervical collar, sit back on stretcher, have the patient lift their legs onto the stretcher, have the patient lie back on the stretcher, secure the patient to the stretcher itself. Spinal motion restrictions for a supine or prone patient to be secured to a long board. Apply cervical collar, log roll the patient, position the board, Position the patient on board, secure the torso, and secure the head and legs. This slide shows you actually how to go ahead and put the patient on the log on the long board using the log roll. Motion restriction for a supine or prone patient with the backboard as a movement device only. Log roll the patient on the backboard, secure the patient to the backboard, move the patient to the stretcher, place the backboard onto the stretcher, instruct the patient to keep his toes, nose, and umbilicus and lined up. When it comes time to use the spinal motion restriction and self-extrication from a, a vehicle, instruct the patient to hold his head and neck in a neutral inline position, assess for pain and tenderness, assess motor and sensory functions, apply the cervical collar, instruct the patient to pivot his legs and body, and instruct the patient to stand up. Have the patient rotate 180 degrees and then sit directly back onto the stretcher. Have the patient lift his legs onto the stretcher and then lie back into the spine position and secure the patient to the stretcher. Spinal motion restriction for a seated patient using a V-type or a vest type. Assess the back, scapula, arms, and clavicles before applying the board. Never use chin cup or strap. Always tighten the torso 
and leg straps before securing the patient's head. Never pad between the cervical collar and the board itself. This is a Kendrick's extrication device. Um, I know that we've seen this in class. Uh, the one I think we have is red in color. After, uh, after a cervical collar has been applied, slip the KD behind the patient and center it. Properly align the device, then wrap the vest around the patient's torso. When the device is tucked well up into the armpit, secure the chest straps. Secure the leg straps themselves. Secure the patient's head and velcro heads and the head straps. Then tie the hands together. Pivot the patient onto the backboard while maintaining an inline stabilization. Be some cases where you're going to have to use rapid extrication or rapid rollout. Three situations in which such movement is permissible, the scene is not safe, the patient's condition is so unstable that you need to move the tra and transport the patient immediately, and the patient blocks your access to a second more seriously injured patient. Using rapid extrication technique, bring the patient's head into a neutral inline position. This is best achieved from behind or the side of the patient, perform a primary assessment and a rapid physical exam, then apply the cervical collar. Support the patient's thorax, rotate the patient until his back is facing the open door. Bring the patient's leg and feet onto the uh, car seat. Bring the board in line with the patient and against its buttocks. Stabilize the cot under the board. Begin to lower the patient onto the board. Depending on the structure of the car, it may be necessary to actually change the position and maintain an inline stabilization while lowering the patient onto the board itself. If the structure features of the vehicle, time and resources of the patient's condition permit, it may be worthwhile to remove the roof before performing in rapid extrication. Depending on the variables such as the vehicle structure and the patient's condition, a rapid extrication may be performed more easily and safely if the roof has actually been removed. There will be some cases where you're going to have to deal with helmets, whether it's a motorcycle helmet or a football helmet. Uh, first it says the patient is wearing the helmet. Assess the patient's mental status, assess the patient's airway and breathing, assess the fit of the helmet and the likelihood of movement, determine your ability to gain access to the patient's airway. Leave the helmet uh, in place if the helmet fits well and there's little or no movement, no impending airway obstructions, helmet removal would cause uh, further injury. You can provide spinal motion restriction with the helmet on. It uh, doesn't interfere with the ability to reassess the airway and breathing. And you remove the helmet if it interferes with your ability to assess or reassess the airway and breathing, interferes with the ability to adequately manage the airway, does not fit well, or interferes with spine motion restriction or the patient's in cardiac arrest. There are two basic helmets, sports helmets and motorcycle helmets. Uh, face masks or football helmets can actually be removed by cutting the plastic clips. Motorcycle helmets generally cover the, fu the full face and prevent access to the airway. One rescuer applies stabilization by placing the hands on each side of the helmet and fingers on the patient's mandible to prevent any type of movement. A second rescuer places one hand on the mandible at the angle of the jaw itself. On the other hand, the second rescuer holds the occipital region. This ma maneuver transfers the stabilization responsibility to the second rescuer. 
ripping the sides apart to clear the ears and allowing the second rescuer to readjust his hands position around the mandible and under the occipital region. Throughout the removal process, the second rescuer maintains an inline civilization from below to prevent any head tilt. After the helmet has been removed, the rescuer on the top places his hands on either side of the patient's head with palms over the ears, taking care of civilization. Sports, it is important that we all work together. When appropriate helmets and shoulder pads should be removed before transport and removal should be performed by a minimum of three trained rescuers. For equipment intensive sports such as football, hockey, or lacrosse, uh, several tools can actually be used to remove the face mask. Spinal motion restriction for the player, remove the face mask and helmet, pat beneath the head, remove shoulder pads and pad, and apply a cervical collar. Restriction in infants and children. Pat from the shoulders to the heels of an infant or child, if necessary, to maintain neutral inline stabilization. Make sure that the cervical collar fits before applying it to an infant or child. And when it comes to extricating from a car seat, just remember that the car seat involved in a car crash might have actually lost all of its integrity. Inline stabilization car seats in an upright position and applies manual civilization to the child's neck and head. Cervical collar is applied to the child as an EMT maintains manual civilization to the head and neck. EMT number one maintains manual civilization. EMT number two places the child's safety, safety seat on the center of the backboard and slowly tilts Tilts it for a supine position. Number one maintains manual civilization and calls for a coordinated long axis move onto the backboard itself. Number one maintains manual civilization as the as the move onto the board is completed with the child's shoulders over the folded towel. EMT number one maintains manual civilization as the EMT number two places roll towels or blankets on both sides of the child itself. Number one maintains manual civilization as EMT two straps or tapes the child on the board at the levels of the upper chest, pelvis, and lower legs. Do not strap across the abdomen. Number one maintains manual civilization as EMT number two places rolled towels on both sides of the head. Then he tapes the head securely in place across the forehead and cervical collar. Do not tape across the chin to avoid pressure on the neck. Now this concludes chapter 32. I want to thank you for viewing the slides. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact me at Southern Star Health Education. Thank you.